Hello, scholars. Welcome uh, to another rousing day of history. Hope you're good. I'm all right. Uh, we're talking the 60s counterculture. Last class, we talked about the 1968 DNC riot. Uh, this time, we're going to be focusing on what are the cultural changes that kind of made that riot happen, uh, as well as how these changes are going to eventually affect American society later. Uh, so let's get into it. We've got some major changes that have happened uh, in the 1960s. Three big major changes. Uh, one, growing economic prosperity. Uh, that's been brought on by World War II. Those returning soldiers are moving to the suburbs. Uh, we've got a baby boom happening. Families are growing. We've got increased college enrollment. Why is that? Uh, remember, one of the ways you could get out of the Vietnam War was if you were in college, right? Uh, we've also got the Cold War happening, the threat of nuclear warfare, as well as uh, some major assassinations. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Robert Kennedy. Uh, we've got a growing poverty gap, right? So we've got a really kind of uh, tumultuous, kind of trouble-ridden society in the 60s, and yet a lot of prosperity. So how do we balance that? Um, that balance there leads to this big thing called the generation gap. What is the generation gap? Uh, so think about the adults in the 1960s. What did they live through? Well, they lived through the Great Depression. They lived through World War II. They lived through the, the propaganda of World War II about how, like, you've got to support America. You've got to buy bonds and, and have a victory garden, right? Uh, the Great Depression, they know what struggle is like they know like how you've you've really got to uh, have a stable job and an education and, and be able to put food on the table. Uh, the kids of the 1960s, they are the most educated generation, right? They're going to college, but they didn't go through all of that that struggle, right? They've experienced the wealth, they've experienced the outcome, and they're looking at what their parents are doing. Their parents value stability. They're looking at their parents, and they're like. Why do we have to do that? Why is that the norm here? Uh, and so they begin to reject their parents' expectations, and they're now looking for, how can I feel good about myself? How can I change society, make it into something that I want to live in? And that is the growth there of what's called the new left. So the new uh, left movement is uh, one of the big changes politically. We also see the youth starting to promote this thing called participatory democracy. Uh, we kind of have the definition right there in the word, right? It's democracy, it's a, it's a government, but we participate in it, right? We have an active role in it. So they're trying to promote direct involvement, specifically by the youth, in political issues, right? They're saying that, like, these are issues that are going to affect us, therefore, shouldn't we have the most uh, voice in that? Uh, so what do we see the differences here between the new left and like everyone else, like the old people? Well, the two major differences, I hope it went too fast. There we go. The two major differences are in equality and freedom and how the youth and how the adults see these things differently. So if you're young, equality is about a, a level playing field. Freedom is about freedom from power, freedom from abuse. Freedom from inequality, right? If you're kind of this older World War II, Great Depression mindset, the adults, for you, equality is opportunity. For you, freedom is the chance to achieve or fail. Focus on the word chance, right? Uh, they're about upholding order, stability, helping those who help themselves. And so this counterculture in the 60s, they're looking to, to change that, to change those expectations. Uh, and so that changing of expectations results in the hippie movement. You've probably heard the word hippie before. Uh, where does that come from? Well, it comes from the word hip, right? If you are hip, if you're trendy, uh, you are a hippie. If you're not a hippie, what are you? Well, you're a square. You're someone who's like fallen into that exact like kind of cookie cutter World War II, Great Depression adult kind of person. Or you are a, a pig, uh, or like uh, someone who's with the establishment, the government, the police. Uh, in hippies, the, these youth are trying to find an alternative way to live, an alternative way from the, the structures that adults have set up. 
Uh, we see two major organizations coming out of this hippie movement. One would be the Students for a Democratic Society. These are organized uh, originally in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and they're all about participatory democracy. They're all about changing uh, how the youth interact with the government. If you think back to that 1968 riot lesson, uh, they're very similar to Moby, the mobilization uh, to, to end violence in Vietnam, very similar to them. So they're about protesting civil rights violations, protesting the Vietnam War, trying to encourage people to not evaluate each other based on you know how well you did in school or what you own or how nice of a house you live in, but they are focused on shouldn't we evaluate people based on who they are as people and what they believe. So we have them, uh, they, they come up with what's called the Port Huron Statement. This is kind of their uh, statement of what we are about as an organization. Uh, and you can, you can pause this video and kind of take a look at these seven major points. But if you look at them, you'll see that they're about um, bringing all of society up and having everyone's voice in society represented in the government. Right? And so we saw there uh, in your Do Now video a statement uh, from a guy named Mario Savio. He was a student. He was part of, of SDS. And you can see there he's talking about we are human beings. We're not just these cookie cutter people, right? We don't want to be these 1950s businessmen in suits. What do we want to be? We want to go out and like play music, hang out with our friends, uh, potentially like be these guys, young uh, entrepreneurs, you could say. Uh, so that's kind of one end, the SDS, they're focused on political change. Uh, the other group who we saw in the 1968, the DNC riot video, is a group called the Yippies, uh, who are led by a guy named Abby Hoffman. And if you recall, the Yippies are about uh, politics and the political system being just a sham. Like, it's all fake, it doesn't matter, and they're all about making people realize none of this matters. So how did they do that? Uh, they would throw pies at politicians uh, while they were giving speeches, right? So they were like, this is all a joke. Uh, they would run for office as a joke. So one of the things is they would campaign to repeal, get rid of all laws, including the law of gravity. That way everyone could get high. Uh, see, there's very high level jokes here. Uh, someone ran for sheriff and they challenged the existing sheriff to a duel at high noon, right? So it's just like the cartoons, but they made it real life. Uh, that person who ran for sheriff got 65,000 votes. I mean, they lost, but like 65,000 votes, right? A significant number of people were like, I get, the, I get their message. I know what they're about. Um, their leader, Abby Hoffman, we see here, one, he put out a book titled Steal This Book. Uh, bookstores eventually started to stop carrying it because sure enough, people started stealing it. Uh, we also see in this picture here that he's holding a pig. That pig's name is Pigasus. Uh, they tried to run Pegasus as a serious presidential campaign because they were like, hey, what's the difference? They're all the same, right? Why not just run a pig, have him be president? Uh, so, uh, why are we talking about the weather? Uh, weather underground, huh? Weather underground, we're getting even more extreme from the SDS. They splinter off. They're classified as a domestic terrorist group. So, they're still in like that new left politics, but they splinter off and they started like rioting through rich neighborhoods. They firebombed a judge's house. Uh, they started bombing the NYPD. They set off a bomb at the Capitol building, the Pentagon. Uh, they started breaking people out of prison. Uh, can I move? Oh, I can move my little bubble around here. Yeah. So they started breaking people out of prison, right? So they're like a way more extremist group. Can I go to the next one? Here we go. We got some images, right? not as peaceful, right? This is not the, the flowery movement that we think of when we think of hippies. Um, probably the, the center piece of where hippies are coming from is San Francisco in California, uh, specifically a neighborhood called Haight-Ashbury. Uh, this was a neighborhood where they were gonna build a highway and then they didn't, and then no one wanted to live in this neighborhood, so everything was really cheap. Who's gonna move in to this cheap neighborhood? Uh, it's, it's the young people. It's the young people who are trying to start a brand new society. Uh, and we got some images of what it used to look like there. Diet Pepsi is being advertised for some reason. Why Diet Pepsi? Who knows? Uh, so one of the first major events that's drawing people 
out to California, out to San Francisco. Uh, one of the first major events is the Human Be In, Human Being, Human Be In. Oh, there's a connection there. Uh, and we see like 20 to 30,000 people all flocking out to California. Uh, the national media is stunned. Like, no one expected this to be a thing. And it really kind of puts into the public eye the hippie movement, the youth movement, the new left movement is, is given kind of a, a center stage here. Uh, and the human being, again, trying to promote those ideas of you are important as a person. Politics is not just about what's happening in Washington, D.C., but you control politics as well. It's about like living amongst each other. It's about being aware of the earth, taking care of the environment. Uh, it's about reaching higher states of consciousness with the use of, of psychedelic drugs, right? Let's not, you know, let's not forget that's playing a huge role here in these gatherings. Um, but they're all about kind of elevating all of society all at once. So we have the human be in, right? And that's drawing everyone out to California. Uh, what's the next major thing here? Uh, well, just a couple years later, we've got Woodstock, right? Woodstock Music Festival in 1969. Uh, this is kind of the biggest, kind of biggest major landmark of the hippie movement, of the New Left movement. This is a four-day music festival. It's held on a farm in northern New York. Uh, the organizers expected 25,000 people to show up. How many show up? 400,000 people. Like, they started charging admission, uh, and then, like, a day or two in, there was, like, there's no way to keep track. The festival's just going to be free. Uh, and the idea here, uh, according to the guy whose farm that they, that they held it on, he looked out at the end of the festival, and he saw these people coming, uh, and he said, if we join them, if we join in with these young people, we can turn those adversities that are the problems of America today into a hope for a brighter and more peaceful future. Uh, so the Woodstock Festival, though, wasn't without like its problems. Uh, there were lack of bathrooms, lack of food, lack of water. Uh, it rained on about halfway through the festival and kind of just like turned this field they were holding the music festival into this like giant mud pit. Um, but I thought it might be beneficial just like get a vibe for what kinds of uh, bands and people were at this music festival. I thought we should probably listen just a little bit. Uh, I'll post some more links if you're interested. Uh, but let's just take a listen here. Uh, this is Santana uh, playing their song Soul Sacrifice. Take, take a look at the crowd. Take a look at the musicians. Uh, try to get a feel for what exactly this festival was like. And then multiply it times, you know, four days. Pause that. Uh, if you want to watch more of that, oh, it's just got a mind of its own. If you want to watch more of that, you can. Uh, but let's go back to the notes. We're so close. Uh, so Woodstock kind of puts on the center stage the counterculture. It puts on the center stage youth culture. Um, and out of that, we also begin to see people taking it even further, separating themselves from society. Some people begin to live in communes. This is basically where just like a bunch of young people live together. They don't necessarily have jobs, but they all just kind of like work to make the village function. Um, we see some different pictures here. Uh, we see members of the hog farm commune out in California, right? So they're all just living amongst each other. You can imagine how the adults, right? The World War II, the, the Great Depression people, how they're viewing that. Uh, what is the result here? So we see a new kind of political movement come up here. We see the rise of a new social cultural movement, but neither of those really represent what the majority of Americans, how they feel, right? That's, that's like a, a 
percentage of the youth, but they're given a national stage through television, newspapers, uh, books, right? So remember 1968. Remember that right. Remember who wins 1968. It's Richard Nixon, right? This guy that we see here in the image. Uh, so Richard Nixon is able to kind of take a look at what's happening in youth culture, take a look at the new left, and he says uh, that he will represent not this new left extreme movement, but he's going to represent what he calls the silent majority, right? The people who aren't in the newspapers, the people who aren't in television. He's going to represent the more conservative group of people uh, who he says represents traditional American values. When you see traditional American values, what's he talking about there? It's the same set of values as those adults who went through the Great Depression, who went through World War II, right? He's appealing to those people. He's appealing to the older adults saying, I recognize that you don't have a voice here that is as loud as the hippies, that is as loud as uh, Woodstock or the human bee in, uh, and I'm going to represent you, the majority, who's been rendered silent by society. And so people are like, I like what Richard Nixon is saying. He represents us. Uh, and so we're going to see the effect of Nixon's presidency uh, in our next lesson. But we see, you know, the new left really kind of like pushes Nixon if you're an adult, if you're in that conservative, silent majority, they make Nixon seem very appealing, right? Law and order, stability. That's Nixon. Uh, all right. Oh, we also see there the success of the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam protests. Those are the two successes of the new left, right? Let's not discount them. They did actually like make some, some big advances here. Uh, as well as the Black Panther Party, uh, as well as Native American rights, uh, as well as uh, Hispanic rights, Cesar Chavez for women, uh, for, for Asian Americans, uh, for the earth, for environmental rights, right? There were some victories here. It wasn't just like Nixon happened, right? There were some, vic some victories, some real progressive changes that the new left and these protest movements were able to bring. Uh, all right, so review your notes. Uh, if you missed anything, just run the video back. And then move on to the next thing in your agenda. Go wash your hands, etc. Take care. Goodbye.